Half a day and good morning. The Committee on Health, Land, Justice and Culture is now called to order. Today's Friday, September 3rd, 2021. The time is 9.05 a.m. Notices for these hybrid hearings were disseminated via email to all senators and main media broadcasting outlets on Friday, August 27, and again on Wednesday, September 1, 2021. The notice was also published in the Guam Daily Post on Friday, August 27, and Wednesday, September 1, 2021. The hybrid hearing is uh, a mixture of online uh, via Zoom and in person, and uh, it will be hosted by the legislature's AV staff and my committee staff. And thank them for their assistance. The host will mute all Zoom participants until called upon by the chair. We have two agenda items for this morning, the appointment of John Q. Lizama to serve as a member, public at large representative of the Guam Parole Board for a term length of four years, from May 19, 2018 to May 8, 2022. Second item on our agenda is Bill Number 154-36COR, sponsored by B. Anthony Ada, James C. Moylan, Christopher M. Duenas, Frank Bloss, Jr an act to add a new sub-Article 3 to Article 1, Chapter 61, Title 21, Guam Code Annotated, relative to allowing the construction of accessory dwelling units, ADU, to residentially zoned lots. I'd like to acknowledge the presence of my colleagues this morning, beginning with the Minority Leader, Senator Chris Duenas. Good morning, Senator, and Senator Anthony Ada. We also have with us on Zoom, uh, Senators Tello Taitigui and Senator Joanne Brown. So we will begin now with the appointment of John Q. Lizama to serve on the Guam Parole Board. I'd like to thank the appointee for being here this morning, Mr. Lizama Cesus Masi. Thank you. Before we uh, hear your testimony, I'm just going to read for those who are listening some of the powers of the Parole Board as stated in Section 85.26 of Title IX, Guam Code Annotated. Board is authorized to release on parole any person confined in any penal or correctional institution on Guam and to revoke parole or discharge from parole any parolee as provided in Article 5 of Chapter 80. The board shall adopt rules not inconsistent with law as it deems proper to carry out its duties and in accordance with the open government law. Such rules shall include rights and restrictions of an inmate during parole or revocation hearing, presence of legal counsel or a lay representative on behalf of inmate during a hearing, the right of an inmate to receive in writing a specific reason or reasons for denial of parole, to include deficiencies to be addressed in preparation for a future parole application, rules for the recusal of a member due to conflict, any other rules in furtherance of the mandates of the board. Nothing herein shall prevent the board from interviewing victims in private. Nothing shall prevent the board from excluding any persons that they determine may unduly influence a victim's testimony. The board may conduct deliberations in closed meetings and may vote by secret ballot on matters relative to the release on revocation of or discharge from parole, notwithstanding the provisions of the open government law. I'd also like to note that the parole board is supposed to consist of five members. So it currently has three members, Chairman Steve Guerrero, June Borja, and Lena McDaniel, whose term has expired, but uh, we have been told that she may be reappointed and we are waiting for the paperwork from the governor's office. There were two other members, Franklin Leon Guerrero and Robert Camacho, who we confirmed in the previous term, but they have both since stepped down. So Mr. John Lazama's appointment will be to replace Robert Camacho's. So we will now hear from uh, Mr. Lazama. Mr. Lazama, you may proceed. Off day, Madam Chair and members on, of the Committee on Health, Land, Justice, and Culture. Uh, my name is John Lazama. Before I begin, I uh, just wanted uh, to let you know that my wife and my son, who uh, 
wanted to be here, unfortunately are not able to be here. Uh, my wife is really inundated at their job at Revintax and my son is not able to take off. Uh, also, my father uh, initially indicated that he wanted to come, but I recommended that he just stay home, you know, to be safe with everything that's going on. But again, I'm here today regarding my appointment by the Governor of Guam to serve on the Guam Parole Board as a public at-large member. Uh, I'm currently retired. I retired from Gulf Guam. Uh, I'm a retired Government of Guam employee. I initially started my career as a youth service worker with the Department of uh, youth Affairs back in 1998. I then transferred to the Department of Corrections uh, and I worked as a parole officer from 1998 to 1991. In September of 1991, I transferred to the Superior Court of Guam, uh, working my way all the way up the ranks uh, to, to eventually becoming the Chief Probation Officer. In 2017, I was appointed by uh, the Chief Justice and the uh, uh, Judicial Council as the Administrator of the Courts until last year when I retired. I retired with 32 years of service uh, with the Government of Guam. I am also a military retiree with 28 years of service in the Army and the Army Reserves. So I'm basically just a retiree staying at home. But as a retiree and as a public at large member, my concern is whether the individual is ready to be released from incarceration. Can the individual smoothly transition from being incarcerated to living in the community? Potentially, this individual may actually reside next to me, may reside next to you, may reside next to family members or friends. So those are concerns that um, I feel that as a public at large member, I need to focus on. Does the individual have a job? Is the individual able to support himself and the family? Are there debts that need to be paid? So what is the likelihood? And the bottom line is what is the likelihood that my decision to release an individual is to, uh, gonna be made to ensure that the community is safe, that the individual will not commit a new crime or recommit a crime. So those are things that weigh in on myself as far as what my duties and responsibilities are as a parole board member. You know, I need to be fair and impartial for every individual who's applying to be placed on parole. Um, my my decisions will be based on the information that's provided in the parole investigation report, the testimony that's provided at all the parole hearings, or the, the individual parole hearing. But more importantly, I'm relying on my experience. My experience as a probation, as a parole officer, and understanding the R&R principle, which is the risk, the need, the resp uh, response, uh, to help in my decision whether or not an individual is going to be released on parole. There are several factors that throughout this process, this decision to release an individual that I need to focus on and that I intend to focus on. The first of which is, is the individual ready to be released from incarceration? What is the risk to the island? What is the risk to the community? What is the risk to the victim? And based on that, I need to ensure that this, vic this individual is not going to commit a new crime. So, with that said, I need to know what are the criminogenic needs? What caused the individual to commit this crime? And what has been done while incarcerated? What has to be done while on parole that's going to help to respond to those criminogenic needs to reduce the risk of recidivism? We need to reduce that risk so that we can ensure that the island is safe. For example, I'll use the criminogenic risk of substance abuse. If an individual committed a crime because he was under the influence, what is the risk? What is the likelihood that the individual will reoffend or commit a new crime? More importantly, what is, 
what is the likelihood that the individual is going to violate one of the parole conditions or our parole conditions when released? Has the individual been assessed? Has the need been identified, determined? And if substance abuse is in fact the need, then what has been done? What treatment has the individual undergone to address those criminal, that criminal need? And more importantly, if we release the individual, does the individual require like outpatient treatment? And more importantly, is that treatment actually available? We can have them uh, begin a program like the residential substance abuse treatment in the Department of Corrections. But if the counselors and the doctors feel that the individual needs outpatient treatment, as a parole board, we need to make sure that that's available. We don't want to set them up for failure. We want to set up our parolees for success. And that's important. Another major factor is the victim. Victim, the victim or victims of the crime. The last thing we want to do is further victimize somebody, a victim. It's extremely important that the victim be heard. And we need to understand as a pro board, how does that victim feel about this individual being released? Are we further traumatizing that victim? And that's going to weigh heavily on my decision whether or not an individual is, should, I should recommend to be released on parole. So, of course, identifying the risks, the needs, what is the response, hearing from the victim. A third factor that I like to consider is the family, e familia. Is the individual ready to return back to home? Obviously, while incarcerated, a period of time has, has occurred. It could be a couple months, could be a couple years. What if it's over a decade? What has the individual done to ensure that he still maintains that close family contact with his family? Is he getting regular visitations? How are the visitations going? Does, he, does the individual understand what has transpired from the time he, was, he or she was initially incarcerated to the, potentially the time he's going to get released? Families have changed, and, and we, we need to make sure that we understand the dynamics of the home. Make sure. Does the individual have an actual structured home to go to? You know, one of the things that I, I want to make sure is that we're not releasing somebody, and then they're going to be homeless. They're going to be standing on the street um, asking for contributions, donations, you know, and all those things. So we need to make sure that the home is structured. You know, they have a place to stay. We're not putting an individual in a home that's one bedroom and there's seven people living in it. So obviously the structure, the home, the home is important. And how does the individual's release affect the finances? Because finance, finances play an important role in the home dynamics. You know, if the individual has restitution that needs to be paid, let's say it's $10,000, that's an additional $10,000 that's a debt that that family now has to cover. Does the individual have a job? Will the individual be able to work, pay the debt, contribute to the family finances so that the dynamics of the home aren't uh, stretched and stressed because of finances? So I'm hoping that uh, part of the report is I'm going to hear from the parole officer that the individual has a skill set, has a trade, something that uh, they can use once released from incarceration. Preferably, I'd like to hear that the individual already has a job lined up. You know, he's, if he's released next month, I have a letter from the employer that says he's going to start as soon as the parole board tells me that he can start so that he can be a contributing member of the community, contribute to his family's finances, and more importantly, start being a positive uh, role model for his kids and the other families. So finances are important, looking at all those things. Uh, if we don't have a job, it's gonna make it tough. And we need to make sure that 
Again, we set them up for success. As a retiree, a member of the military, um, one of the things I hope to see in the report is whether or not the individual was ever in the military. And if the individual was in the military, are, they, are there VA services that are available to them, to that individual that the individual can take advantage of? Um, it could be as simple as, you know, counseling, some sort of educational benefits that the individual may be entitled to or, or whatever, but at least be able for the individual to be assessed to see if, in fact, they, they're, they can make, uh, take advantage of the services that are available through the VA. Finally, the decision as to whether an individual is ready to be released into the community as a productive member of society is a huge responsibility. Uh, based on my experience, based on my knowledge, uh, plus the information that's contained in the parole investigation report, the testimony that's provided at the hearing, uh, I feel that I can perform that job as far as the decision to, as to whether or not an individual is to be released. And I'm here before because I wanted to advise you that I am willing to serve as an at-large member, public at-large member for the Guam Parole Board. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chief Zama, and I appreciate what you have said in your testimony. Um, just one second, if I could ask my staff, is Chief Kanata going to testify? All right. Um, I, I wanted to let you know also that your, the packet that was submitted to us with your nomination, your nomination packet has your prior government service and employment history, but it does not include all of the service that you've told us today. And I, I think it should. So I would like, I'm going to try to trans, of course, we're going to transcribe what you've said, but if you've got a more full resume, uh, please send it to us. I'd like to attach it. For example, it talks about your, your experience at the Judiciary and Probation Office, but it doesn't at all talk about you being a parole officer. Okay. And uh, I think that's um, hugely important in this position and uh, very relevant. So uh, that type of thing, if you could. The, um, uh, I'm glad to hear, I think your experience is going to be very valuable. Obviously, you have a good handle on what's the goal of parole and what, uh, what we need in order for successful parole. Have you, have you seen successful parole? As a parole officer, yes. Um, again, I feel that, that parole can be successful if we set the individual up for success. Obviously, uh, I think in, I forgot the individual's name, but the individual had a home to stay. He had a family that was willing to, to support him, even extended family. He even had uh, the extended family members come in and provide testimony. So he had the family structure there. He had the extended family structure. He had a job that was waiting for him. There was an employer that submitted uh, a letter to the parole board uh, via myself as a parole officer that uh, upon release, he's going to be employed by my office, by my company. And I think that's very important. At the time, uh, we didn't have risk, needs, responsivity tools to use. We basically relied on the information that, was, that we garnered as a processor, that we garnered from the family, from the institutional um, uh, DOC records and everything. And, but what, one thing that helped was while the individual was incarcerated, he did not have any major incidents uh, while incarcerated. So that led to the success. And of course, a proper parole supervision plan, checking on them, making sure that they check in as required. I, I think it's monthly. Uh, of course, maintaining employment. I don't believe the individual had restitution to pay, so that was you know, one less burden to worry about. But I've seen it. Uh, I've also attended conferences with the American Probation and Parole Association uh, in Boston, and they talk about re-entry. We, we, we attended that, and 
we also heard testimony from uh, some uh, former parolees and probationers as far as their success and what helped them transition from incarceration back into uh, the home, back into the community. And, you know, we take a lot from that and we learn that we need to really make sure that uh, we set the individual up. Or if, it's, if, it's, if the individual doesn't home, we need to be fair. We need to be honest and say, I'm sorry, you're not ready to be released. You don't have a place to stay. Um, and I think that's where we have to be fair and impartial uh, and make sure that we're fair and impartial to all, everyone. But yes, I have seen it, Spear, I have. And, I've had, and I have heard testimony uh, in conferences and trainings that I've attended uh, nationwide. That's good to know. And um, I'm very, I think they're very uh, fortunate to have your experience on this board and your retirement to help them uh, on a voluntary basis. That's huge, I think, with your experience with assessments and treatments, of course, and, and successes nationwide. Do you, what, what do you feel the parole board's role is if they are not ready for parole? I think the parole board, as a parole board, we need to be fair. Uh, we also need to be honest with uh, every individual that's coming forward. Um, and that can be done by way of uh, making a decision because the individual is not ready to be released to deny, to deny the parole request. At the same time, what is the feedback? The feedback can be from the board or from the actual parole officer. Uh, we can notify the chief parole officer, Chief Kanata, you know, Chief John Azama didn't make parole. We are denying his parole. But these are the reasons why. Can you and your staff work with John Azama and have him work on these things while incarcerated or work with his family to make sure that these things in place. Uh, simple thing could be a home. If we find out that the individual, like I said earlier, is being released, but it's only a one bedroom home and there's seven people staying in there, obviously we need to be concerned. Would that be a risk? So working with the family and saying, you know, let's look at your dynamics. Let's look at the composition of your family and say, can we come to an agreement that you need more than a one bedroom home? Is there, is there, sir, are there services available that you can, you know, attend? I think it's important that we're actually honest to the family as well. You know, if the individual's family is staying in government housing, I believe that Guam Housing and Urban Renault uh, Gura has an issue with uh, a convicted felon actually residing in government housing. So we have to be honest with the family and say, you're currently in government housing. You need to check with Gura and verify with Gura whether or not you can actually have your husband or, or your wife come and stay with you. Because what we don't want to do as a board is release the individual only for them to, for Gura to terminate their lease. And then they're stuck with trying to find a home within what, hours or days? And that's a huge stressor for families. And it's not gonna be easy, especially if they're actually receiving the government assistance to stay in that home at no cost to them. But now they have to find a different home, which is price of rent and homes have gone up significantly that it's a huge stressor. So as a pro board, we need to be honest with uh, the applicants, those that are applying for parole. Thank you. And um, as Chief Probation Officer, you were instrumental in implementation of risk assessments, different assessment tools at the judiciary. So I'm very grateful for that. I've been a big proponent and even passed a law requiring that uh, criminal sexual conduct cases not be released on parole unless they can be properly assessed. And so I'm relying on you to ensure that they use the correct assessment tools for the rec the correct type of cases, right? As you described as substance abuse, but I know that for different types of cases, we need different types of tools. And if these are not available in our community or treatment has never been available for some of them, then that, that we have to be honest with ourselves. And that's, um, 
I think the errors that the parole board has made in the past, right, is that we have not had treatment, not even assessment tools that they're at, available to them to make these decisions or to help them in making these decisions. And so I, I hope that you will continue to help us uh, by pretty much putting your foot down until we get those, you know what I mean? And, and pushing whoever can help us to get those in place, to get them in place so that we can treat if possible. And if, and if that's not available, that to be honest about that as well, um, because the risk has not diminished perhaps, right? So I, I wanna thank you again for your testimony and your experience and being willing to provide that to this board. I'm going to open it now to uh, Senator Duenas. Just Masi, Madam Chair, and uh, Mr. Lazama, I, I, you know, I want to thank you for accepting the call to service once again um, and stepping up to the plate to do this very um, uh, difficult and necessary um, job that we have in our community. Like, I, I really appreciate your testimony. It's very clear with your experience and your distinguished career that you're going to bring a, a wealth of institutional knowledge and capabilities to the board. I, I really don't have any questions based on your testimony, but I, one thing I think that was key in your testimony, and I wanted to see if this is something you would bring to the board and the organization is, you know, you discussed that the training that you've received, and I think this is so important um, because, you know, uh, other jurisdictions, other areas, you know, uh, just, just the the background that it takes to be able to make such a critical decision. Um, do, do you look as you look to your role maybe as mentoring and ensuring that your other, um, you know, board members that work with you, I'm sure they have uh, other, you know, uh, qualifications as well. You always like a board to have a makeup of, of different walks of life and perspectives, right? But do you, um, do, do you see it as maybe uh, one of the things you could bring to the board is to say, you know, let's, Let's make sure you've been to a training or a conference or something to understand kind of the different dynamics of parole board operations. Yes, I do. I think it's important. I was extremely privileged as a probation officer to attend various trainings, um, supervision, uh, risk assessments, even as far as implementing the tools at the judiciary. Um, I think that needs to occur at the Department of Corrections with the Parole Services Division. Um, one of the things that um, would help is membership. Um, membership into the American Probation and Parole so Association, membership into the National Institute of Corrections, uh, making sure that uh, the parole folks are, uh, have access to the Bureau of Prisons, um, and also have what is known as a you know, friends in other jurisdictions that they can share information with. One of the things with the American Probation and Parole Association is they have both a winter and a summer uh, training institute. And at the training institute, they bring in probation officers, parole officers, board members, and everyone. And they have over 42 different uh, our to our programs that that's available to everybody so i think for the parole uh, division services division for the parole board that if we could have membership in the american probation and parole association then that makes those training opportunities available with technology who knows we could be able to uh, do it via teleconference a video call and also, they have the library that you can actually pull different uh, documents and information and, and read ahead or read on the latest and greatest in the field of community supervision. So that I would recommend to the chairman, to the uh, chief probation uh, parole officer, to the director of uh, DOC that uh, if funding is available, would you consider um, making that available to the parole officers and even the parole board? I don't know what that. Um, also, and as well as, like I said, uh, National, National Institute of Corrections. Because there's stuff, there's training out there that can be done online, preferably uh, in person. 
And we don't need to send everybody to Boston, Atlanta. We can just have two presenters come to Guam and have them do the training here. We did it at the judiciary. Where we bring the subject matter experts uh, to the judiciary. We use the Judicial Education Center and we train up our probation officers and our judicial officers on different things. That same thing can be done with the parole services division um, and, and of course, those of us on the parole board. So we don't necessarily have to fly out. If we can bring them in, let's bring them in. It's gonna be way cheaper. Uh, one of the things I did as a probation officer was when my family and I were out on vacation um, stateside, if there was an opportunity for training, then I would actually go to that training after my vacation and then return home. So, you know, that saved the judiciary money because I was already out there. And all they're doing is paying the travel from one city to another, the per diem for the time that I was there, and that's it. You know, so that's another thing that we can recommend to the other board members or the parole officers themselves to say, hey, if you're out in, you're out in California and there's, there's training, there's a facility nearby or there's a, a training going on through APPA or um, NIC, then why don't you try to register and, and we'll see if, you know, hopefully there's money. Everything's based on funding. Uh, and I, I have no idea what the budget is for the Department of Corrections. So I don't know if that's even available for them. But it would be good for them to have it. I really just appreciate the full comprehensive scope at which you, you know, have this understanding and uh, I look forward to uh, voting on your confirmation. Uh, my, the key thing I think that what you've indicated which is so on point is you can judge the progress of the individual through their time uh, incarcerated. You, can, you, have all, you have everything and you have the information coming forward. But I think you're absolutely right. It is what you are setting that individual up for. Um, you, you have to make sure that this super high probability of success and you've hit all the main key points, opportunities for employment, uh, a place to stay, all these things that will, will, will uh, you know, did the individual receive treatment, you know, when they were, if, if they had, if they were there because of some sort of co-occurring issue, substance abuse and the like. Um, those, those are all just so fundamental, Mr. Zamas. I just thank you for your willingness once again to serve, and uh, you certainly have my full support. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Senator. Senator Ada. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Lazama, thank you for being here today. Uh, thank you for your 32 years of service to our government, 28 years as a retiree in the military. And I had the opportunity to serve with you in uh, the 368 military police. So, you know, I, you and I go way back. And um, I, I thank the governor actually for appointing you to this position. Uh, your, your many years of experience in law enforcement and probation and parole and dealing with uh, individuals that, you know, perhaps seek a better life after, after they serve their time. And how is it that we can help them and help them move forward and move up, you know. Um, you, you've been a part of that for the many years in your, your service as government. And um, I just want you to know that uh, I'm glad that you accepted the, the appointment and the position and perhaps somewhere else within our government you will be able to um, use your, your expertise, your knowledge and wisdom to, to help other, in other areas as well. Um, the only thing is I hope you had your honey-do list already uh, worked out and I hope Maria is not looking for you to do any other things because uh, you're going to actually have your, your hands full with all these, with, uh, with the uh, Guam Parole Board. But thank you again, sir, for your, your many years of dedicate, dedicated years of service to our government, to our military, our armed forces, and again for coming up and stepping up to the plate to, to serve our island once again. I really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank uh, Chief Parole Officer Michael Kanata, who is present today. Uh, he prefers to um, uh, listen in 
the foyer. Uh, and uh, I want to thank him for his service as well and for, you know, caring enough about his jobs and duties to um, be here today to listen in and, and to the testimony and to the questioning that will definitely affect his work going forward. I'd like to now uh, recognize Senator Taitagui for any questions or comments. Sijis Masi, Madam Chair, for the opportunity. And uh, I'd uh, like to thank uh, very much Mr. Lazama for stepping up to the plate, especially for this board. Of all the boards that we confirm um, as senators, I think this is one of the most uh, important ones as well as most contentious ones as well. Um, it takes somebody with a lot of guts and courage act, actually to sit on a board like this. Um, I think people recognize the danger uh, that comes along with uh, serving on this board. And I wanted to make sure I was here today to um, thank you for stepping up to the plate. Uh, the good thing is that I know that you have some experience in most boards, not only uh, in this jurisdiction, but as well as uh, jurisdictions in the states that there's a requirement of at least five years of experience in the correctional or in the law enforcement uh, field. And definitely you, you, fill, you filled that protocol. Um, and so I guess the only question I have along with that would be, why would you want to serve on this board? Thank you for the question, Senator. Why? After 32 years of service as a probation and parole officer, I feel that I can further help the field of community supervision. And it's, it's really like a promotion, a step up, you know, when you, you, when you work it and you're able to become a, a, a board member, it's, it's really an honor in a way because you're recognized as, with, for your experience and your knowledge that you're actually capable of serving on a board, which is why I'm here. Um, it's, throughout my career, I've been able to start in, like, on the bottom and work my way up, and I think this kind of naturally is the next step for me as, as a retiree is still be able to still contribute to the community uh, using my experience and my knowledge uh, to help in, in, the, in this process and in this, this decision. It's a huge responsibility. Uh, we're all a bunch of volunteers. Uh, I do have the time because I'm retired, of course. I do have the time to do this and I think in a way, it helps me train the parole officers because that's where I started. So Chief Kanata is doing that now, but as a member of the parole board, I, maybe there's something that I can do to assist the parole officers uh, in their job so that maybe one day they'll be part of the board. Maybe one day they'll be the chief parole officer or they'll be on the Guam parole board. But certainly I have some experience that I'm willing to share with the parole board itself, Mr. the chairman and the other members. I have some experience and knowledge that I'm willing to share with Chief Kanata and his parole officers. And, you know, the bottom line is the parole board is a huge responsibility. Nobody wants to be on the parole board. It's not the most prestigious boards of all. It's an all volunteer board, but I think when you have dedicated members like the other three members, uh, myself, and we're able to step up to the plate and we're able to do our duties and our responsibilities, uh, that's huge. This is not a board that everybody goes to the governor and says, governor, put me on the parole board. I wanna be on the parole board. <laughs> I certainly did not do that. <laughs> but when I was asked, I said yes. That, thank you so much. I mean, that said so much about yourself, your character, uh, your willingness to, to share the knowledge that you have was, was really very, very important. Um, thank you for that. And again, thank you so much 
for wanting to step up and sitting on this this board. And if, and if there's anything I can do, my door is always open uh, to help you. So thank you again, Mr. Lasama, and good luck to you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Taitsugui. Senator Brown, you are recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and certainly good morning to you, Mr. Lazama. Uh, good morning. I have to tell you, we sit through a number of uh, confirmation hearings. Yours is rather refreshing this morning uh, to hear your perspectives and also the um, you know, extensive background you provide that I think will be a tremendous asset uh, to the board. Uh, primarily because, you know, I, I'm sure you agree, many members of our community are really concerned with, with the crime that has happened on Guam. And, and, you know, I'm very much of the view that we need to have a system of justice and a sense that justice has been given. And while not all of us are perfect, gosh, we are all imperfect, uh, but for those that have offended our society and have committed crimes against our people, there has to be a sense that you know, there's a fairness in that, that, that those that have committed those crimes have, have paid their, you know, paid their price back to society by serving. And then the challenge comes for those that are, you know, the time comes before you sitting on the parole board to determine whether or not these individuals have indeed uh, paid for their crimes and are, are able and capable of returning back to society and being productive and constructive members in our community. And that's the challenge, but I think your, your very straightforward uh, view that you have, I think will be tremendously helpful. I mean, we recall not that long ago, a few years ago when the parole board had let uh, an individual that was incarcerated who had been put in jail, uh, essentially for uh, child molestation and then ended up, unfortunately, you know, you had a little girl going to school and, and he, um, committed a terrible crime against that child and terrible crime against our community when, when we see and hear this type of violence happening. It's, it's very frustrating and very disheartening. Um, I'm sure in some cases, you know, some people probably cannot, even with the best of counseling and therapy, be returned safely back to our community. And there are probably also, had they been given the opportunity and the guidance and direction in their lives uh, that can be very productive members of our society and even better because they the road that they've walked has been a lot harder they appreciate you know the freedoms they have to be engaged with their families and with the community so i i'm very pleased with your appointment i don't doubt you will do well but i wanted to ask you what do you do in those circumstances certainly uh if i don't doubt you'll be confirmed to this position uh, but when you do see and hear of uh, these type of crimes, like the one I described to you with this young child, um, how will you look at those issues? Because I know you have to weigh both the interests of the community, which I'm sure for you is very important. And then also just, uh, you know, do you, do you determine has someone served their time and should they be brought back into the community? Because I like the fact that you're wanting to ensure that they have some stability and foundation in order to grow. But uh, I wanted to ask you about that because it's those terrible crimes, some of the heinous crimes and the murders that happen here. Um, you know, that the public and those that are victimized by it obviously um, would be concerned. So I wanted to get your feedback on that. Thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, this goes back to something that I mentioned in my testimony. Risk needs response. R and R motto. Have we or has the individual been assessed? What are the risks to the community? What is the likelihood that the individual is gonna commit a new crime, recommit the same crime, further victimize the victim? What are the reasons why the individual committed the crime? What are those criminogenic needs? Is it anger and stress management? Is it substance abuse, uh, finances? All those different criminogenic needs. Did those contribute to the reason why the individual committed a crime? And if so, we have the risk to the community. We have the needs that have to be identified before an individual is released. And if we find out that, that, in, we, that the individual has not received the proper treatment, uh, education, treatment, services, if the individual has not uh, done that, then as an individual board member, I'm gonna say I don't recommend parole. That's it. There are other voting members on the parole board. We have, an, we have independent votes that I believe we all have. So 
as far as I'm concerned, if the risk is high, if the criminogenic needs there are several, but if more importantly, if there's nothing that has been done to meet those needs, to re further reduce the risk, then as a pro board member, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna vote for the release of the individual. It goes back to another statement I made earlier, setting them up for success. I'm not gonna release an individual in the community who's gonna further victimize somebody, who doesn't have a place to stay, who doesn't, uh, has you know, in instability at home and you're gonna send them back to that same home. I need to assure the island, the community, that this individual is ready to be released. And I know what's gonna happen if, uh, if I make, or we make the wrong decision, we're gonna be sitting right here at an oversight hearing, ex explaining why we did this and why we, did, why we didn't do this. That's a huge responsibility. And we're all volunteers. You know, we're doing this, and if we can make conscientious decisions based on the information that's provided to us, uh, then we'll make that decision. Obviously, that's what we do. You know, it's a huge responsibility, but we're willing to do it as a board member. And I think I recognize the other board members that have been doing this longer than me. And more importantly, I recognize board members who are willing to serve additional terms on this borough board. Because this is, this is gonna, in a way, it's gonna be stressful on us. We have to hear all these things. But for a board member to say, I'm willing to tell the governor, I'm willing to serve an additional term, you're not gonna find that. And, and those board members need to be commended. Just like you're, you're saying, you're commending me for stepping up to the plate now, but if a pro board member is willing to take a second term or a third term, then we should really commend those folks. Those are the ones that deserve it more than me. I hope I've answered your question, Senator. No, I appreciate it. I, I, you know, I appreciate it. And I think the reason we're commending you is because you're definitely not being appointed to one of the glam reports in the government of Guam. It's probably one of the toughest boards uh, for any community member to want to sit and serve. Just because, as you mentioned, the nature of what's involved. I mean, we're dealing with human beings and with very difficult, very difficult decisions. One other question that I did want to ask, um, you know, almost daily, of obviously, we see the problems and crime in our community related to a whole variety of things, including, you know, substance abuse. But for all those that are out there committing the crimes that we see them holding up, you know, their, 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 being, their, their picture of arrest that we normally see in the media, there's, you know, sometimes multiplied that many more victims in our community, individuals that have been victimized by these whole variety of crimes. And I wanted to ask, what, are, what is your view? And I'm sure you're probably not going to know for sure till the time comes, but when victims come and come forth uh, before the parole board and testify for their either most cases, uh, we hear they may not want an individual to be released because of the type of crime that was committed, some very heinous crimes, uh, including murder in our community. Um, to what degree are you going to take that into consideration? Because, you know, we're, I'm very much of the view that um, you know, our law-abiding citizens uh, in our community have a right to be protected. Um, I'm, I'm sometimes not as sympathetic, especially when I see some very bad crimes that have been committed against our people. Uh, but, you know, there's the challenge. They're, they're still human beings as well. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, you know, what are your, how will you would take that into consideration in making your decision as well? Because I, I very much appreciate your candid uh, response that you provided in evaluating whether or not uh, an individual seeking parole is is prepared and has the foundation to be successful. Uh, but just in weighing perhaps some of the crimes that might have been more serious crimes and, and victims who come forth to perhaps maybe testify for or against an individual, uh, how will you take that into consideration in making a decision? Thank you for the question. Uh, as I stated earlier, uh, the victim is important process in this decision-making process. We need to hear from the victims how they feel. I don't want to further victimize some uh, victim, but I need to know as a parole board member, how do they feel about the possibility of this individual being released from the Department of Corrections? 
uh, how does that impact them and their families? Is the victim still in fear that the individual will commit the same offense, commit a new crime, further hurt the victim or somebody else in the community? And that's why I said that's one of the mo uh, most important factors that we need to consider is the victim. Now, obviously there are risks and those risks need to be minimized. That's why I've always been in favor of a risk needs responsivity model principle that we identify the risks, we identify the criminogenic needs, we do what we can to bring the education, the treatment, the services to respond to those criminogenic needs so that we further reduce the risks so that we don't have to worry about recidivism, a higher rate of recidivism, or this individual committing another crime. But we have to take into consideration the victim and how the victim feels. Certain crimes are, I'm telling you, it's going to be tearful when we have to hear the victim's statement. It's not going to be easy. And we have to take that into, into account when we make our decisions. And so that's why it's important to hear from the victim. If I see in a parole investigation report that the victim is not aware of the parole hearing, that the victim has not been contacted, then I have to talk to the chair and say, Mr. Chair, I'd like to table this hearing and I'd like to recommend that the parole officer assigned to this investigation make every effort to contact the victim because as a parole board member, I want to hear the victim. So again, if I see that the victim has not been notified, the victim hasn't provided anything, then I will ask the chair, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, can we table this hearing and can we get the parole office to contact the victim? So it is important to me. I hope I've answered your question, Senator. You have, Mr. Lozama. I appreciate it. And certainly in the cases where the victim may have been killed, uh, I'm, I'm sure if their family's there, uh, you, you will consider that. I mean, I, I have to tell you, this is a very refreshing, <laughs> refreshing hearing to hear you talk as directly as you are and the you know, the experience that you bring to the table firsthand, I think will be a tremendous, tremendous asset to the parole board and certainly look forward to your continued work because I don't doubt you'll be confirmed. I wish we could multiply you uh, because we need that. I mean, you know, we have a lot of good, wonderful things happening on Guam and why it's home and why we love being here. But I think we all recognize we have many issues to deal with, with crimes and injustices in our community. Uh, and how do we deal with it? How do we deal with those perhaps that, that cannot be paroled? And for those that have the opportunity, like you said, how do we, how do we create a foundation for success so that they can come back and be you know, productive and contributing members uh, with our society? So thank you. Thank you for your, your interest and your, your desire to want to serve our community in this capacity. With that, Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity to be able to ask Mr. Lozano some questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Senator. Senator Brown. Before we move on to Senator Blast, if I could just, uh, there was a time when victims and those uh, up for parole were in the same room waiting for their hearing. And I've had many conversations with victims' families who do attend these hearings. And if you could just keep that in mind, they do not know who they're in the room with and they absolutely don't want to find out later that you know they are in there with uh, uh, you know, they, they'd like to be kept separate if that's possible. I'm just going to, I know that they've been trying, the parole board has been trying to do that, but if, yeah. I know they also were looking for space before, but I'm glad, uh, I think they've resolved all those issues. So I'm gonna now, uh, Senator Bloss, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Good morning, John. Good morning, Senator. It really doesn't surprise me that uh, you've actually stepped up to the plate uh, with regard to this. You know, I, mean, I remember the day that you retired and you know, all the accolades and the you know, appreciation <coughs> from the community um, for your service. Uh, and I've known you for, okay, we won't say that. Okay. 
but I've known you for, 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 for quite a long time that it didn't surprise me. It didn't surprise me that uh, when you were asked, you accepted it. I've never once, once seen you, you know, when, I think I asked you at one point in time after you retired, it says, so what do you think you're going to do now because you've got so many things in your plate and, and different things that you want to do? So with that, thank you. Thank you for stepping up. I think that just from what I've heard uh, validates, uh, you know, the confidence that I have for you, in you, um, to serve well on, on, it may not be a prestigious board, but it's certainly one that is very necessary because you do represent the concerns and the voices of the community mm -hmm. um, when it comes to whether or not an individual has properly been, uh, you know, that has, that has been in the system, that has, that has been uh, criminally prosecuted and, and was serving a punishment, whether or not that individual has, in fact, uh, redeemed, rehabilitated, you know, recognize their, you know, the, the ills of their ways and, and, and wants to contribute back into society. And with the vast knowledge that you have in the field of probation, you know, in the, in, in the criminal justice field it's, itself, uh, it, it's going to be a valuable asset to the board. And, it, and, and so thank you, you're gonna bring that. Question that I have, John, is in recognizing what your role is going to be and what you're going to be tasked or what you're going to be a, um, empowered to be able to provide, for lack of a better term, Do you see any need for any systemic change or anything that you'd like to be able to introduce? You, you mentioned earlier there, there's a model that, that, that you, you want to see uh, utilized more. But are there other areas um, in the system uh, that um, you'd like to as well um, see whether or not it it's utilized more or utilized at all um, to help to improve the system, to help to improve the, 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 uh, the you know, the pro parole, the probation system that it ex exists today. Thank you, Senator. Um, there was a conference that I attended that talked about community supervision and the highlight was how uh, the role of probation and parole officers has changed or transitioned from a law enforcement uh, duty to a more social uh, supportive role in, in the community. Uh, it goes back to something I said earlier, which is ensuring that the individual is set up for success. So certainly one of the things, and I have not talked to uh, Chief Kanata, I have not talked to the chairman of the board um, or any of the other current board members, but what I want to do is kind of based on what I just said earlier, go in and assess, assess the board, assess the functions of the parole services division, the Department of Corrections, and make my recommendations to the chairman as far as improvements that could be made uh, as a board. Uh, certainly improvements, uh, make recommendations to the chief, to the chair, of course, or the director at DOC as to what needs to be done for the parole officers and the parole services division as a whole. And looking at what is it available even for uh, the community to further understand what parole is and what we do. So there's training opportunities that are available do we need to look at our statute uh, and say, okay, if we're gonna implement an r and r principle and r and r model, then statutorily, can we put that in so it's mandated? Statutorily, can we put that in there so it's mandated, funded, executed? That's it, put it in there. If 
you're going to require us to identify the risks, use these tools, then provide us with the necessary tools that we can use to help in our decision making process because it's a huge decision. There's looking at even the composition of the board, looking at other jurisdictions. What is their composition? Is it strictly five members? Do they have other members up to 11, seven or 11 so that we're not putting so much strain on each of our board members to have to hear every month all these different requests and the stressors that can be put on us having to hear victims and hear all these things. Maybe we need to have more members and say we now have seven and out of the seven we're going to use a minimum of four for three for a hearing because you need an odd number. So you three will take this month, the next three will take the next, next month and the next three so that we're not sitting there, especially if we have to have special hearings after the regular hearings. And if, if we're going to have special hearings and have to hear it every week, you know, that's a stressor on the board. That's going to be a huge stressor on us. So maybe, and I, I've looked at the statute with regards to this confirmation hearing. And I've looked at, and I thought about it. Wow, it'll be nice if, if the board members had training. It'll be nice if we were able to either bring in somebody or go to another jurisdiction and see how they run it, just to make sure that the roles are there. It would actually be nice to have more board members so the stressors are less on each one of us. But everything is, would be nice. Everything is, can be nice, but everything's based on funding. And if the revenues are not there, if the funding's not available for us, then what we're left with, each of the board members, is to rely on our experiences and rely on our knowledge to help make that decision. Because it, it's all gonna weigh on us whether or not we're gonna release an individual. And so we have to do that. Same thing with the pro officers, they have a hard task. But if there's something that can be done to help them in their job, we implemented electronic monitoring over at the judiciary. I'm a proponent of electronic, I'm a supporter of electronic monitoring. I feel that when an individual first gets released on parole, uh, they should be on an electronic monitor. Maybe for the first, take the parole supervision term of five years, maybe for the first year, put them on or her on EM so that we're able to track, the parole officer is able to track if they're successful then we go to phase two, which is you don't need EM, but you need to do this. And so we do a phase in approach to, su to community supervision based on the term of uh, parole. We have different phases. You're released, but you're on phase one. That means you have to check in this, this, this. In phase one, you're gonna be on electronic monitoring. In phase one, you're required to complete all this education and treatment before you can do this. And that's where I feel that some of the uh, experience, some of the stuff that I did at the judiciary, I'm hoping that we're able to implement it in parole. I mean, I actually started my community supervision experience in parole. You know, I was a parole officer one. So, uh, and Chief Kanata and I, he was senior to me at the time. I think he was a pro officer two or three. So I've worked with uh, Chief Kanata. But I think, yes, I would like to do a lot of things. And I like to recommend a lot of things to the board and a lot of things to the director of uh, DOC, uh, uh, Director Carbolito. But if there's no funding, I feel bad. I know what it's like when, you're, when funding is tight. But there's so much that can be done. And if we have, if it's available, then I think we should make it available to them. Mandated in the statute, update the statute to require r, &R assessments, uh, the use of uh, uh, assessment tools, the requirement for uh, the victims to be notified, the requirement for 
uh, restitution to be addressed before the parole hearing so it makes it easier for us to decide whether or not you know all these things but if maybe and i'm not here to tell you how to do your job senators please i'm not here i'm just saying i'm talking out loud saying i think these are some of the changes that uh, i feel that can be worked on and some of the things that can be implemented and if funding's available then great if not rely on our knowledge rely on our experience make uh, decisions that are impartial that are fair based on the information provided that's all we have thank you i hope i answered your question you more than answered my question thank you very much that, but see john that's you and i appreciate that you know i don't want to belabor this anymore you do have my support um, uh, on your confirmation i want to first off thank you for your service and then con console you on what you're about to because as your, your family know, you're not coming home anytime soon, right? Based on a lot of stuff. Yeah, well, congratulations, John. Good luck. And uh, we look forward to, to, to helping you and being able to make some of those systemic changes that, that will improve the system. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Madam you. Thank you, Senator Blas. Thank you again, Chief Lizama, for your willingness to serve on this board that requires long hours. The, my understanding is their meetings sometimes go eight hours. They go all day because they have a lot of uh, cases to consider and they have to hear testimony from you know, both sides and victims' families as well. So it's a huge commitment and I'm so very glad that they chose you for this because of your experience and your, your honest answers with us today and your willingness to provide recommendations. And I want to encourage you to continue to do that we are open to those, and uh, we want to allow all the parole officers and the parole uh, board members, and of course, even, even those who are up for parole, to, to receive what is necessary for success. So uh, again, um, is there anything you'd like to say in closing otherwise? Yeah. i just like to thank yourself and the other members here um, for, for allowing me to provide the testimony and I hope I've answered all the questions that were um, asked of me and if there's anything that uh, I could do again I'm here I'm willing to serve I'm willing to serve and so I'm here to help and I think uh, uh, yes my experience is is probably overwhelming but my intent is really to support the chair, support the other board members, support the, the community supervision process, the parole officers and the chief. Um, I'm only one voice. And, and really, I'm only one person on the board. I make one vote. There are other board members that have a huge task like I do. Thank you. Thank you. There being no further testimony, we will consider the appointment of Chief John Mazama to the Guam Parole Board, duly heard. The time is now 10.15 a.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Kaneta.
Hello. We'll now move to uh, the second item on our agenda, which is Bill Number 154-36 COR. We will begin by uh, allowing the sponsor of the measure to give an introduction of the bill. Senator Anth Anthony Atta, you are recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Speaker, Bill 154-36 is an ad an act to add a new sub article 3 to article 1 chapter 61 title 21 Guam code annotated relative to allowing the construction of accessory dwelling units to resident residentially zoned lots uh, thank you madam speaker for having the hearing on this bill uh, ADUs are apartment like structures attached to or separate from a single family detached home that includes a bathroom bedroom kitchen facilities and you know, uh, they're also known as granny flats or in-law suites. At present, such structures cannot be legally built. Uh, the aim of this bill is to increase housing affordability while promoting multi-generational living. ADUs are an excellent way to provide housing for adult children who just returned from, from college uh, and, and seeking employment, uh, newlyweds who are uh, saving to buy their own home, but most importantly, our aging parents uh, who wish to you know, live with us but, you know, independently and also for caregivers. And if enacted, this bill will fill a major gap in Guam's housing needs. Uh, currently, there are no assisted living facilities on Guam. And you know, assisted living facilities which provide independent living for elderly persons who may sometimes need the assistance of medical personnel. Accessory dwelling units allow our elderly parents to reside in the same property as a child, but still maintain independence and privacy. This bill allows these units to be built on a single lot, either as an attached or detached structure, and they must comply with all the building code standards and EPA regulations. Additionally, the units must comply with the zoning setback requirements. All building and environmental permits are still required. If the unit meets electrical and plumbing requirements to be separately metered, then the occupants may obtain their own utility accounts separate from the main house. Um, this bill provides a relatively inexpensive means that allow children to care for their parents while still maintaining independence. Uh, again, Madam Speaker, I'd just like to thank you for having the hearing on this bill, and I look forward to hearing the testimonies that will be provided. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Adda. We have uh, received one written testimony that is from the Department of Land Management. And so prior to this testimony, um, we had invited the Guam Land Use Commission and the Department of Land Management to provide testimony. And um, we do have on Zoom with us, who is just present for the hearing, uh, not necessarily going to testify, the chairperson of the Guam Land Use Commission, Dr. Anita Enriquez. And uh, we did receive a letter from the Director of Land Management, Mr. Joseph Borja, which I will read into the record right now. And we just received this just a few minutes ago. Um, so it says, it's Friday, September 3rd, Bill 154-36. Subject bill was discussed by the Application Review Committee on Thursday, September 2, in a regularly scheduled meeting. The bill was treated as if it is an application to be reviewed by technical staff. A review was done on the bill, and these were the comments and issues brought up. One, cost of housing to provide for these kinds of situation is very high. Two, there are cultural aspects to these kinds of situations. Three, a building footprint limitation might be considered. Some R1 lots can be as small as 500 square meters or 5,000 square feet. Some R1 lots are unsewered. A minimum lot size might be considered. In an unsewered lot with a detached unit, you would need adequate space for an additional septic tank and leaching field. A concern about the confirmation and enforcement process for the one degree of consanguinity or affinity, children, siblings, sets of in-laws, consider the types of proof needed for the various types of relationships. Number six, 
a concern about requiring the owner to use the GLUC conditional use permit application process for the unit, cost of consultant and time frame. Number seven, utilities set their own standards and requirements for participation in their system. Number eight, the bill is too broad. It covers and affects land use, building code and property value, appraisals, mortgaging, and refinancing. Number nine, septic tank sizes are determined by the building occupancy. In an attached situation, the tank size requirement might not be adequate for the additional building square feet footprint. Number 10, the use could shift after time. Number 11, real property taxes should be affected. Number 12, a reconsideration of utilities, basic charges and service development fees might occur. Number 13, apartment-like occupancy can be presently applied for with a conditional use permit application for a duplex in an R1 lot. We also received a fiscal impact note from the Bureau of Budget Management and Research, which says that there may be potential revenue to be received by the government of Guam in the form of fees, permits, and residual taxes as a result of the construction of an ADU. However, absent information regarding the potential of ADUs to be constructed, the average cost of contracting an ADU and homeowners requiring conditional use permits to rent or lease their ADU, the Bureau is unable to provide an approximate financial impact. Legal review by our own legal bureau is pending. Um, there being, I just want to confirm, there's no one else present to testify on the bill. All right, I'm going, yeah, I'm just going to state my questions for the record for the sponsors and then allow the other senators to also state questions or, or comments on the record. Uh, I had reviewed, so Hawaii has a similar requirement or a, a allows ADUs, but they, they, they list some very specific um, limitations to their ADUs. For example, square footage, the lot area must be a minimum 3,500 square feet. It cannot be landlocked. It uh, must contain or it does not already contain more than one dwelling unit. And I, I noticed that on our R1 zoning laws, we do allow for duplexes and already on R1. Uh, in Hawaii, they also require that the property owner uh, will reside in either the primary dwelling or the ADU. And that the property owner will record covenants running with the land, with the Bureau of Conveyances or the land court of the state of Hawaii. And if you have signed a private covenant prohibiting ADUs, you cannot build one. The lot fits one parking space in addition to the parking required for the primary dwelling. The ADU will have a maximum size of 400 square feet. Some of these um, those are the requirements in Hawaii, and I just thought those should be considered as well for Guam. And so I'm glad that the Department of Land Management raised some of those, and I would ask the sponsor to assist the, the committee in perhaps, you know, considering some of the limitations on, on these uh, additional, additional units. Uh, I do support the intention of this, and I, I do agree with, you know, the more affordable we can make housing, particularly for family members, we should try. I just want to be able to protect all the, you know, residents in the neighborhood, protect our community, the sewer, and all of those that were brought up by DLM as well. So I am, I will continue to, you know, work with a sponsor on um, providing limitations so the Guam Land Use Commission also has parameters on this type of uh, additional use. I will now recognize um, Senator Duenas. Senator Dismasi, Madam Chairman and our Chairwoman, excuse me, Madam Speaker. I, I think you certainly have, um, you know, brought up some significant uh, questions. Obviously, as a co-sponsor to the bill, um, I'm in support of it. Uh, as we 
have done so many times in this legislature, uh, whether through the public hearing process or even on the floor, uh, there's always opportunities to improve upon uh, legislation. Um, I think that, and I'm glad that you mentioned it, Madam Speaker, you realize that, um, you know, not only the, uh, uh, you know, the size of our island and the land that's available, but just simply um, now the cost uh, of construction and, um, you know, the ability to, to try to provide um, additional living space. I think that's kind of interesting because just listening to uh, <laughs> prior hearing, um, one of the things brought up was, you know, the opportunity to um, provide space and, and, and use, uh, you know, property to its highest and best use, particularly when it comes to, you know, family and these opportunities. So um, I certainly take to heart as also a former director of land management, their, their recommendations and some of the things that you've mentioned. Um, I have um, been seen applications in the Guam Land Use Commission before. Um, you know, sometimes residents who would even use housing uh, for different reasons, such as child child care centers and other and the like. You know, and, the, and they do they put the requirements in to to go beyond what the expected capacity was uh, for the property, be it you know uh, environmental issues uh, for uh, waste management and the like, and so. Um, Certainly look forward to improving this bill, um, but I, I, as like I said, as a co-sponsor, I believe in the, in the merit, I believe in the intent, and uh, hope to work with the prime sponsor and every member of the body, Madam Speaker, to improve uh, opportunities to provide additional dwelling space uh, for our families. Uh, in closing, you know, a lot of times, you know, we, 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 wanna, we wanna help our family, and we wanna do it the right way, and we wanna have units available that we can help but you know, there's a lot of dignity and, 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 and uh, there's a lot of dignity in being able to have, you know, spaces that provide for, for individuals to have accommodations uh, that, that, you know, um, allow for a higher quality of life. I think that's what we're looking for a lot here too, you know, um, individuals to prepare their meals, to have additional accommodations where, you know, they, they have that dignity within that space as well. Uh, so those are some of my thoughts, Madam Speaker. I look forward, uh, as you said, uh, you know, to you working with us and every member of this body to improve this uh, valuable piece of legislation. Sijus Masi. Sijus Masi, Senator Duenas. Senator Taitikwi. Sijus Masi, Madam Speaker, for the opportunity. And I, I stand in total support, uh, especially the intent of this legislation. We're seeing a growing need in this type of community and our families assisting. And it's not just our immediate ones with regards to, you know, the, the, the children of our Manamku, but uh, many of them have left island and um, our Manamku refused to leave because this is home for them. And in their twilight years, they want to be able to, to be here, to uh, enjoy their, their time. Uh, what they have left here on Guam. And sometimes you get relatives, even close relatives to provide that kind of uh, assistance for them. And I hope this you know, legislation going forward, we can uh, take care of those issues that were addressed. And I think we can um, because of the need on this island. Uh, you know, a lot of times we're finding individuals um, you know, with no place to go. And um, definitely we don't have the facilities like at St. Dominic's or other places like that. Uh, Tranquilidad, which many times been attempted to, to grow that facility um, or even utilize that land to build another, uh, you know, senior citizen uh, facility, care facility. Uh, this is an issue that needs to be addressed. And I thank the author of this legislation to, to know that there is a true need and an issue that we have that this body needs to assist. Even the government, uh, the, the governor needs to look at and move forward into a direction to help this growing Manamco. Uh, uh, and I, I really appreciate the opportunity, uh, Madam Speaker, to speak on this. And I, I ask that the uh, testimony be provided to all senators from Department of Land Management so we can look at this 
and uh, appreciate the study that you've done uh, in Honolulu, Hawaii, Hawaii with regards to this. I'm pretty sure it's throughout Hawaii, not just Honolulu, but in Hawaii. Um, other than that, uh, the other questions were asked, uh, answered with regards to land management. So again, I appreciate the time and um, appreciate the, again, the sponsor of this uh, bill uh, moving forward and addressing the need. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Taitsui. And for all senators, the um, testimony has been provided on the Zoom chat uh, as a one of the documents. And to the senators here in the hall, it has also been provided. And of course, will be made available uh, to the public. All right, and so Senator Brown, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I, I certainly support uh, the intent uh, with Senator Ada's bill. Uh, but I think it would be helpful if we had further discussion on it because I, I recognize the need. I think we can all agree there's a need. We have leads for many things in our community, but it's it's how can we do it in a way that, um, you know, can allow the facilitation of one landowner's interest in needing to do this and an adjacent landowner's interest perhaps in wanting to have a certain degree of setback requirements. I know the bill indicates that setback requirements will be adhered to. Uh, but we also need to determine how is this going to be um, regulated. And I hate to use that word, but uh, we have existing structures right now that are in violation of the building code where additions have been made uh, that don't meet the building code requirements. And then also to what limit are we talking about? Are we talking about one, two, three, four, five units? I think those are the type of questions that would be productive perhaps if there's further roundtable discussion on how can we facilitate to address that uh, but then to what degree of density are we talking about? And, you know, a sewer available, if it's a septic that's required, obviously there were all constraints with regards to septic requirements in terms of land area, as well as the location of where that construction is occurring, particularly if it's northern Guam above one of our sub-basins. So um, I very much support the idea of what's brought forth in this bill, but I think there's a little more discussion that we'll need to happen and input so that we can address those concerns. And then I don't know, again, how are we going to regulate the process? We're claiming that, you know, it has to be within a, a immediate family member or to a certain degree. And then if not, it has to go before the land use commission because people might have the immediate need for an immediate family member. Let's say we have an elderly couple uh, that wants to have an immediate family member living or residing with them or vice versa. A lot of our, our families, as uh, they get older, they'll turn over the main house to their, their child and then live in an adjacent uh, a unit that's been constructed to the house that has its own maybe a small kitchenette, a bathroom, and obviously a, a bedroom area to rest. But then after as time goes on, and that need is no longer there, maybe that unit can be used as a rental for additional income. And there's certainly a need for that in the community as well. It's just a question of how do we standardize this type of construction and to what degree of intensity. Uh, you do have some housing developments on Guam that do have covenants, of course, and how does that address with a covenant with existing law? Um, and then how does it, how do you deal with this issue in housing developments where house, where the land actually, the land size is, uh, you know, sometimes very restricted and very small lots. Uh, and are the buildings designed structurally to hold the second floor if that's the intent to build up because, you know, the, the limitations to the land size. So I think there's a lot more discussion that would be helpful if we could sit down and, and discuss that in a forum where we can have uh, DPW, certainly land management and EPA as a regulatory with regards to sewer uh, and water related issues uh, involved so that we can actually pass legislation that can be uh, you know, contribute to the need in the community, but also address the other concerns that have been raised as a result of unregulated and un, uh, unpermitted development that has occurred on the island. With that, Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity to comment on, on Bill 154. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Bluff. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, one of the values of having to speak after Senator Joanne Brown is she spent, already spent, mentioned it at all. Okay, so thank you very much, Senator Brown. I, uh, too, support the, uh, the intent of the bill, obviously, uh, as, as, as co-sponsor to the legislation. I think I am, right? Anyway, so, um, and, and yes, recognizing and, and seeing and appreciate the, 
the effort that the Department of Land Management through their application review committee using that process to be able to uh, bring up uh, some of the um, issues that uh, I'm sure we're going to be able to satisfy, but more so, uh, you know, I looked at it and I said, you know, sometimes government gets in the way of what we want to be able to do in this progress and, and maybe this is a good step and a good start to be able to start to look at what are some of those government processes that may continue to exist but are not necessarily salient or, or you know, necessary for, 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 the, for the time frames. I recognize too that there are, again, um, I think that it was, it was intentional that the, the bill is broad enough so that questions like this can be brought up. It, it, it's, not, it's not an impediment to, to the progress of the bill, but it, it helps the bill create a strong legislation that's strong and can withstand the test of time. But I just want to end with this. I, I think that this bill has got a more profound meaning than just wanting to be able to provide um, another structure onto the lot. What this bill provides is enable for us to be able to strengthen our culture, strengthen the people that we are, strengthen that in our families, family is the nucleus of, 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 uh, and the center of our lives. And unlike many other places in the world where at the end of their, in their twilight years, unfortunately, you find many grandparents and grandparents who no longer have any constant contact, any contact at all with their family members. It is not within our culture to be able to do that to our uncle. It, it, we try to find all the ways to be able to, so that we can continue to provide to them the way they provide it to us. And furthermore, a lot of times, a lot of the land that we're looking at was land that was brought, that was given to us by our manunku by our manyaina, so that, you know, it is, it is, it's still within the confines of, 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 of the family. So what, that's what this bill is, means to me. It helps us, this is an opportunity to, to strengthen our culture, strengthen our beliefs um, in what family should be. I want to thank the sponsor um, for this and for this opportunity to be able to work on that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you very much, Senator Bloss. I'd also like to uh, just acknowledge that the Department of Land Management's testimony was provided with the support of the Application Review Committee, and I wanted to state their members so that we know that we are, there are many agencies that may be involved pre-GLUC review, so I'm very glad that they reviewed this bill as well. That includes the Department of Public Works, Guam Environmental Protection Agency, Bureau of Statistics and Plans, the Department of Agriculture, Guam Power Authority, Guam Water Works Authority, and the Department of Parks and Rec and Historic Preservation Office. And so I'd also like to thank Dr. Anita Enriquez uh, for being here today with us. Thank you, uh, Doctor, and for your service on the commission. And um, as you have heard, there are issues that the commission will be dealing with. So if there's any way that we can assist in, in um, providing some more uh, requirements in the law to preclude, you know, uh, some of the discretion or, you know, just to make it more kind of reliable for people who are applying for this, that if you comply with these rules, uh, you know, you may be approved. I'm thinking that that might help, you know, that we can give them that type of notice in advance if the commission or the ARC members come up with more, you know, uh, help us to come up with some more solid requirements. And with that, um, I'm going to allow our, the sponsor of the bill, primary sponsor of the bill, uh, to close on the bill. Thank you. Senator Ada. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And to my, um, my colleagues, uh, thank you for all your input. Uh, to my co-sponsors, uh, Senator Chris, Senator Frank, and Senator James, uh, for uh, co-sponsoring this legislation with me. Uh, Madam Speaker, as you know, this starts the conversation now on a need that we know is here. And how we move forward with the bill uh, the input that is given to strengthen the bill and to make sure that the guidance are all set into place prior to uh, passing this into into law. So I thank all of uh, I thank everyone for their input. I thank the Department of Land Management also for their testimony provided here today. Again, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Senator Ada, and to all my colleagues who have been here with me this morning. There being no additional individuals to present testimony, this committee will continue to remain open 
for 10 working days following this hearing for the acceptance of any additional public testimony on, on this bill. You may submit testimonies to my office at the Guam Legislature in the Guam Congress Building or through email at senatorterlahiguam at gmail.com. The public hearing is now adjourned and the time is 10.40 a.m. Si Dios más y todos. <laughs>